want to make a uh, video about a man by the name of Voltaire. And uh, what I'm going to do is start off by going to uh, Wikipedia. That is a portrait of Voltaire. He was born November the 21st, 1694 in Paris, France. He died May 30th, 1778. So let's read what Wikipedia has to say about him. You're going to find this very interesting, so it may bore you in the, bore you in the beginning, but pay attention. <clears throat> Francois Murray Adorette. Known by his nom de plume, Voltaire. That would be his uh, pen name, Voltaire. His real name was Francois Murray Adorette. He was known as Voltaire. He was a French Enlightenment writer, a historian, and a philosopher who was famous for his wit and for his advocacy of civil liberties, including freedom of religion, freedom of expression, free trade, and separation of church and state. Voltaire was a prolific writer, producing works in almost every literary form, including plays, poems, novels, essays, and historical and scientific works. He wrote more than 20,000 letters and more than 2,000 books and pamphlets. He was an outspoken supporter of social reform despite strict censorship laws with strict, with harsh penalties for those who broke them. As a satirical polemicist, he frequently made use of his works to criticize intolerance, religious dogma, and the French institutions of his day. Voltaire was one of several Enlightenment figures along with, I'm not going to read all these names, whose works and ideals, whose works and ideals influence important thinkers of both the American and French revolutions. So no one can deny that he has a place in history that is prominent, relevant, and significant. Now keep that in mind. Nobody can deny that. Okay, and this is just a little bit of his biography, a little bit. Um, I went to Google. I did a Google search for one book in particular, authored by Voltaire. It was called Candide. And because it is in the public domain, it has been reprinted numerous times. And these are various covers for that book. And I'm doing all of this to establish clearly the credibility of this man as a author. Okay. As an outspoken supporter of social reform. His works and ideals influence the important thinkers of both the American and French revolutions. Okay. Let's see. He was famous for being a French Enlightenment writer, a historian, historian, and a philosopher famous for his wit and for his advocacy of civil liberties. Now, there's one book in particular, and that's the one that I just showed you that I want to focus on, this book called Candid. Okay, now that book is available on the internet. You can download it. You can just go to um, Google like I did. Type in uh, these words, Candid by Voltaire, and just add the word, just add this, PDF, or PDF download, and then you could download the entire book. And we're going to take a look at it. Now, I've downloaded it, okay? And it was published 1759. Here it is in its raw form, okay? It's uh, an interesting read. It has 30 chapters, but we are going to focus on one chapter. And we're going to focus on some truth that the Eurocentrists hate, because truth to them is like kryptonite is to Superman, or even better put, a cross to a vampire. I didn't write the book. The man who did, and you pretty much, if you know me, and you know my channel, you know where I'm going. So all I can say is anyone doesn't like what I'm about to do, go argue with the source. 
because I don't want to hear it. Chapter 11, The History of the Old Woman. I want to keep this video short, but I can read pretty fast when I want to. <clears throat> so I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'm just going to read all of this. Bear with me because it's important. And I already know the arguments that the Eurocentrists are going to present, and, I, and I'm ready for it, but <laughs> depends on what mood I'm in. I might not want to deal with the stupidity. I don't know. Let's just read it. I have not always been blear-eyed. My nose did not always touch my chin. It's going to be boring in the beginning because you're not going to realize where it's going, but just pay attention, please. Did not always touch my chin, nor was I always a servant. You must know that I am the daughter of Pope Urban X and of the princes of Palestrina. To the age of 14, I was brought up in a castle, compared with which all the castles of the German barons would not have been fit for stabling, and one of my robes would have bought half the province of Westphalia. I grew up and improved in beauty, wit, and every graceful accomplishment, and in the midst of pleasures, homage, and the highest expectations. I already began to inspire the men with love. My breast began to take its right form, and such a breast, white, firm, and form like that of Venus of Medici, but my eyebrows were as black as jet, and for my eyes they darted flames and eclipsed the luster of the stars, as I was told by the poets of our part of the world. My maids, when they dressed and undressed me, used to fall into an ecstasy in viewing me before and behind, and all the men longed to be in their places. So obviously this is a woman who is pretty vain about how beautiful she is. And, uh... Again, this is the history of an old woman. It's in this very famous book, Voltaire. I mean, Candy by Voltaire. Now let's continue reading. You're going to see where this is going in a moment. I was contracted in marriage to a sovereign prince of Massa Carrara. Such a prince, as handsome as myself, sweet-tempered and agreeable, witty and in love with me over head and ears. I loved him, too, as our sex generally do for the first time, with rapture, transport, and idolatry. The nuptials were prepared with surprising pomp and magnificence. The ceremony was attended with feasts, car carousals, and burlettas. All Italy composed sonnets in my praise, though not one of them was tolerable. I was on the point of reaching the summit of bliss when an old Marchionis, who had been mistress to the prince, my husband, invited him to drink chocolate. In less than two hours after return from the visit, he died of most terrible convulsions, but this is a mere trifle. My mother, distracted to the highest degree, and yet less afflicted than I, determined to absent herself for some time from so fatal a place. As she had a very fine estate in the neighborhood of Gata, we embarked on board a galley which was gilded like the high altar of St. Peter's at Rome. In our passage, we were boarded by, Sally, by a Sally Rover. That is a ship, uh, by the way. It's like a pirate ship. Our men defended themselves like true Pope soldiers. They flung themselves upon their knees, laid down their arms, and begged the Corsair, that's what they called pirates, to give them absolution in articulo mortis, the Moors. That's who they were invaded by, the Moors. Presently stripped us as bare as ever we were born. My mother, my maids of honor, and myself were served all in the same manner. It is amazing how quick these gentry are at undressing people. But what surprised me most was that they were a rude sort of surgical, they made a rude sort of surgical examination of parts of the body which are sacred to the functions of nature. I thought it was a very, I thought it a very strange kind of ceremony, for thus we are generally apt to judge of things when we have not seen the world. I afterwards learned that it was to discover if we had any diamonds concealed. This practice has been established since time immemorial among those civilized nations that scour the seas. I was informed that the religious knights of Malta never fail to make this search whenever any moors of either sex fall into their hands. It is a part of the law of nations from which they never deviate. I need not tell you how great a hardship it was for a young princess and her mother to be made slaves and carried to Morocco. Let me stop for a moment. Because I get so much commentary on my channels from all of these, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and call them idiots. I don't feel like being politically correct or nice at this moment. Because I'm, I'm just really sick of this, the ignorance. They, they, they will literally say things like, oh, there are no black people in Morocco. And if they were, they were slaves and all that. Wait a minute. Here is a white man of renown a white author of renown, a historian, someone who 
was considered an important thinker. He influenced the important thinkers of both the American and the French revolutions. And he's writing this book talking about a young princess, a white princess, and her mother were to be made slaves and carried to Morocco. Okay, well, maybe these people, these Moors are white, as the Eurocentrists want to believe. So let's just read some more. You may easily imagine what we must have suffered on board a Corsair, again, pirate ship. My mother was still extremely handsome. Our maids of honor and even our common waiting women had more charms than there were to be found in all of Africa. Wait a minute. I told you this woman was obviously pretty vain. Why does she feel that her mother, who was still extremely handsome, her maids of honor, and even her common waiting women had more charm than were to be found in all of Africa, and that includes Morocco, which the Eurocentrists want to tell you is white and has always been white. Why does she feel that they were basically more beautiful than any of the women that could be found in Morocco, any place else? Why? I'll tell you why. Because she knew they were black, not white. Let's just read some more. As to myself, I was enchanting. I was beauty itself. This woman is vain. <laughs> I was beauty itself, and then I had my virginity. Hey, but you know, hey, if you're you can back it up. Maybe she... But anyway. But alas, I did not retain it long, this precious flower, which had been reserved for the lovely prince of Masa Carrara, was cropped by the captain, which had not been reserved, which had been reserved. Okay, let me back up. I'm sorry. But alas, I did not retain it for long, her virginity. This precious flower, which had been reserved for the lovely prince of Masa Carrara, was cropped by the captain of the Moorish vessel, who was a hideous white man and thought he... Wait a minute, let me back up. I think I read that wrong. The captain of the Moorish, Moorish vessel, who was a hideous Negro. Eh, but this guy who wrote this, what does he know? Voltaire. Um... He was a hideous Negro and thought he did me infinite honor. Indeed, both the princes of Palestrina and myself must have had very strong constitutions to undergo all the hardships and violences we suffered before our arrival at Morocco. But I will not detain you any longer with such common things. They are hardly worth mentioning. Upon our arrival at Morocco, which is in North Africa, for anyone that doesn't know, most people do, I'm sure. I'm not trying to be condescending, but I want to be clear. Upon our arrival at Morocco, we found that kingdom deluged with blood. Fifty sons of the emperor Moli Ishmael were each at the head of a party. Okay, so this is the emperor. Moli Ishmael. Sounds like a Muslim. They want to tell you they were all Caucasian. Let's see what this says. The emperor Moli Ishmael were each at the head of a party. This produce, produced... 50 civil wars of blacks against blacks, of tawnies against tawnies, and of mulattoes against mulattoes. In short, the whole empire, obviously of Morocco, was one continued scene of carnage. Now for the word tawny, um, in fact, let's just look that word up. Basically, that would mean a uh, darker skin, but not necessarily a full Negroid person. No sooner were we landed than a party of blacks, when they landed in Morocco, which the Bureau Centers want to tell you is white people's territory, it always has been, particularly back at the time of the Moors. We were no sooner were we landed than a party of blacks of a contrary faction to that of my captain came to rob him of his booty. Okay, so her captain, the pirate captain, was black. No sooner than they had landed than another party of blacks, but not of the same faction. They were of a contrary faction. They came to rob the other black captain of his booty, his loot. Next to the money and jewels, we were the most valuable things he had. 
<laughs> this woman is so bad. I witnessed on this occasion such a battle as you never beheld in your cold European climates. The northern nations have not that fermentation in their blood, nor that raging lust for women that is so common in Africa. The natives of Europe seem to have their veins filled with milk only, but fire and vitriol circulate in those of the inhabitants of Mount Atlas and the neighboring provinces. We're just going to read to hear it, then we'll be done. They fought with the fury of the lions, tigers, and serpents of their country to decide who should have us. A moor seized my mother by the right arm, while my captain's lieutenant held her by the left. Another moor laid up laid hold of her by the right leg, and one of our corsairs held her by the other. In this manner, almost all of our women were dragged by four soldiers. My captain kept me concealed behind him, and with his drawn smith tar, cut down everyone who opposed him. That's a sword, type of sword. At length, I saw all our Italian women and my mother mangled and torn in pieces by the monsters who contended for them, the captives, my companions, the Moors who took us, the soldiers, the sailors, the blacks, the whites, the mulattoes, and lastly, my captain himself were all slain. Now, where did these white people come from? Those are the white people that she was sailing with when... Her ship was boarded by the Black Moors. Those are the people that put up a valiant fight against the Black Moors. They were killed, and so was everyone else. This is fiction, but again, it is written by a very famous historian, a white one. Let's see. And lastly, my captain himself were all slain, and I remained alone, expiring upon a heap of dead bodies. Similar barbarous scenes were transacted every day over the whole country, which is of 300 leagues in extent, and yet they were missed. The five stated times of prayer. They never missed the five stated times of prayer enjoined by their prophet, Muhammad. I disengaged myself with great difficulty from such a heap of corpses and made a shift to crawl to a large orange tree that stood on the bank of a neighboring rivulet where I fell down exhausted with fatigue and overwhelmed with horror, despair, and hunger. My senses being overpowered, I fell asleep or rather seemed to be in a trance. Thus I lay in a state of weakness and insensibility between life and death. When I felt myself pressed by something that moved up and down upon my body, this brought me to myself. I opened my eyes and saw a pretty fair-faced man who sighed and muttered these words between his teeth. O chi se cara di serer zensa coglioni. Anyway, um, this is one of a multitude of literature written by prominent people of the Caucasian persuasion who clearly and incontrovertibly, without hesitation, repeatedly, whether it is in songs like the famous um, uh, Song of Roland, uh, the poem Song of Roland, uh, whether it is in books or plays like Shakespeare's Othello, um, uh, or, or paintings by one of the most famous European white artists there is, Rembrandt, he painted a uh, painting called, uh, let's see, let's just go to it. Port portrait of a Moor. Oops. Rembrandt painted these. Port okay. Portrait of a Moor. Take a good look. Now, you know, so the Eurocentrists can argue with the uh, historians just like they can try to... Four studies of the head of a Moor. That's the name of this painting. Four studies of the head of a Moor. And they all happen to be what? Caucasian? No. Negro. Real portrait of a Moor. They don't even have any white ones. And there's another. Um, go argue with Shakespeare. Argue with Rembrandt. Argue with Voltaire. Argue with um, 
even the one who is considered the father of modern history, they even want to argue with him when they don't like what comes out of their mouth when they describe the Moors or the Egyptians as being dark-skinned and woolly-haired. That would be Herodotus, who they consider. Let's go to Herodotus. Another white man there is. Herodotus was an ancient Greek historian who was born in uh, yada, yada, yada. He has, been, he has been called the father of history and was the first historian known to collect his materials systematically, test their accuracy, yada, 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 yada. The main thing is he described the Egyptians as being dark-skinned and woolly-haired like the Ethiopians. And I think that's enough truth for um, for this video. You know, it's a never-ending uh, quest for truth. And it's a never-ending battle against stupidity and ignorance. Willful ignorance and willful and woeful stupidity. They would prefer ignorance over truth any day. Okay, do this. They would argue with God Himself if it would help their Eurocentrist dogma and ideology to believe what they desperately want and need to believe, and probably instinctively. No is a total lie. This painting is referred to as two Moors. Obviously, Negro. But see, if you listen to the Eurocentrists, they would have you believe that Afrocentrists, is what they want to call you, just make this stuff up. That there's no foundation for it. There's, there's not a plethora, a plethora of, of of, of, of imagery and books and articles and, and, and statues and, and evidence and statements and everything else, historical documents and accounts and eyewitness accounts. And I mean, I mean, there are, there are a numerous books where the white slaves who were taken by the black Moors back to North Africa, back to Morocco, back to North Africa, where they talked about their accounts and they describe these black Moors in unflattering terms, like, uh, the way, of uh, Voltaire did in this book where this speaking for the, this woman who says that uh, he was a hideous Negro. I don't care if you call him a hideous Negro as long as you're calling him a Negro or black or tawny or whatever you want as long as you are historically accurate and consistent. They were because th th this was before the memo of whitewashing all of history had ever been written. And all they were doing is recording the truth with no agenda. And it's important that we stay on top of the truth, that we learn the truth, which has been kept from us. It's out there. 